Bourne needed to be alone with his thoughts. Curled up on the sofa, his mind seemed to be on fire. He was convinced that Dr. Schiffer was the key. He had to find him. The problem was Bourne was quite certain he didn't have much time left. Schiffer had been missing for some time now. Molnar had been dead two days. If, as Bourne feared, he'd disclosed Schiffer's whereabouts under articulated interrogation, then Bourne would have to assume that he was by now in enemy hands, which would mean that the enemy also had in his possession whatever it was that Schiffer had invented, some sort of biological weapon, codenamed NX-20. Who was the enemy? The only name he had was Stepan Spalko, an internationally renowned humanitarian. And yet, according to Khan, Spalko was the man who had ordered the murders of Alex and Mo and had set Bourne up as the murderer. Khan could be lying, and why not? If he wanted to get to Spalko for his own reasons, he'd hardly announce them to Bourne. Khan. The very thought of him caused Bourne to be flooded with unwanted emotion. He concentrated on his rage against his own government. They lied to him colluded in a cover-up to keep him from the truth. Why? What were they trying to hide? And what if Khan was telling the truth? What if he was Joshua? When Kevin McCall had been assigned the born sanction, he'd been on top of Ilona, a young Hungarian woman of his acquaintance. He and Ilona were in the Kirai Turkish baths on Fu Utsa. With a grunt of frustration, he unwound himself from her and picked up his cell phone. There was no question of not answering it. When it rang, it was for a sanction. He listened without comment to the voice of the DCI on the other end of the line. He'd have to go now. The sanction was urgent. The target within range. Two jets stood on the tarmac of Nairobi's Nelson Airport. Both belonged to Stepan Spalko. Both had the logo of Humanistas Limited on fuselage and tail. Spalko had flown in from Budapest on the first one. The second had been used by his Humanistas support staff, who were now inside the jet that would return him to Budapest. The other jet would be taking Arsenov and Zina to Iceland, where they'd be rendezvousing with the rest of the terrorist cadre, flying in from Chechnya by way of Helsinki. Spalko stood facing Arsenov. Zina was a pace behind Arsenov's left shoulder. You've lived up to the letter of your promise, Sheikh, Arsenov said. The weapon will bring us victory in Reykjavik. Of that there can be no question. Spalko nodded. Soon you'll have everything that's due you. Spalko drew out a leather briefcase, unlocked it. Passports, ID tags, maps, diagrams, the latest photos, everything you need. He handed over the contents. The rendezvous with the boat will be at three hundred hours tomorrow. He looked at Arsenov. May Allah lend you strength and courage. May Allah guide your mailed fist. As Arsenov turned away, Zina said, May our next meeting lead to a great future, Sheikh. Spalko smiled. The past will die in order to make way for that great future. Zina laughing to herself in silent pleasure, followed Hassan Arsenov as he mounted the metal ladder into the jet. Spalko watched the door close behind them. Then he crossed to his jet, waiting patiently on the tarmac. He pulled out his cell phone, dialed a number, and when he heard the familiar voice on the other end of the line, said without preamble, The progress Bourne has been making is an ominous development. I can no longer afford to have Khan kill Bourne in a public way. Yes, I know, if he ever meant to kill Bourne. Khan's a curious creature, a puzzle I've never been able to solve. But now that he's become unpredictable, I've got to assume he's following his own agenda. If Bourne dies now, Khan will fade into the woodwork and not even I will be able to find him. Nothing must interfere with what will take place in two days' time. Do I make myself clear? Good. Now listen. There's only one way to neutralize them both. McCall had received not only Annika Vadosh's name and address, by an extraordinary stroke of luck just four blocks north of the baths, 
but also her photo via a JPEG file downloaded to his cell phone. As a result, he had no trouble recognizing her when she came out of the entrance to 106-108 Fu Utsa. He was immediately stirred by her beauty, the authoritative manner of her gait. He watched as she put away her cell phone, unlocked a blue Skoda, and slid in behind the wheel.